It's a bright and cold morning here in Davos and we are absolutely thrilled to have with us one of the biggest voices globally in artificial intelligence, Dr. Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, managing general partner at AI Fund and co-founder at Coursera. That's a lot of things, Andrew. But thank you very much and welcome back to Money Control at uh, Davos. Uh, I want to start by asking you, Andrew, you know, since the last time we spoke, there have been so many developments um, in AI. This morning I saw a news report which said that OpenAI has possibly achieved a breakthrough you know, in doing PhD level work with their AI agents or super agents. Um, Mark Zuckerberg of Meta said recently that they might not need engineers anymore to write code. Are we moving too fast along the AI curve? Because you know, this seems to be displacing white collar workers first. You know, I think there is no way, practical way to slow down AI, but I think there's a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that everyone is lifted up and we don't leave people behind. I think for our nation like India, what I would say is leapfrog, leapfrog, leapfrog. The nature of work is changing. And in the future, I think almost everyone, not just software engineers, but also marketers, recruiters, journalists, uh, would better use computers much more powerfully than it was ever possible before. So to anyone worried about your job, I say, learn to code, take control of it, because in the future, the ability to direct computers to do exactly what you want will be one of the most important skills. And so I don't think AI will replace people, but people that know how to use AI will replace people that don't. So let's, let's make sure as many people as possible are those that know how to use AI. Should people really learn to code anymore? Because there's one view that why should you learn to code anymore? You can just, you know, key in a prompt and you automatically get whatever program you want. So it turns out that to get a little bit technical, um, writing English or, or some of the language prompts, it works a lot of the time, but not all the time. And so now and for, I think, quite a long time, people that know how to code will be able to get computers to do much more than people that don't understand at a deeper layer how the computers actually work. So for example, I know how to code reasonably well, but I code much less because I get the AI to write a lot of my code. But if I didn't know how to code, I would really do much less with computers. In fact, some of the studies seem to show that um, AI-assisted coding is giving a bigger boost to people that know how to code than people that don't know how to code. Right. Um, Andrew, are we reaching the limits of scaling laws in AI or is there significant room for improvement? So the um, lemon is getting harder and harder to squeeze. With every generation, scaling laws get a bit harder. I think there is more juice in that lemon. It is worth, you know, maybe one or two more squeezes. But in terms of AI progress, frankly, I'm, I'm not worried because with multiple fronts by which AI is advancing, not just scaling laws, but also um, agentic workflows where you can get an AI to not just Blurt tell the response right away, but iterate and think for a long time before giving out a response. And so I find that the set of tasks that AI could do, it grew a lot because of scaling laws, just more computers, bigger data. But now we have other paths as well, very promising to keep on expanding the set of tasks AI could do. Right. Um, Andrew, you know, everybody is talking about agentic AI and AI agents. Um, how soon will they be economically viable? And with the rise of agentic AI systems capable of reasoning and planning, um, you know, what key breakthroughs are needed to make AI agents truly autonomous and widely deployable in business and research? I think they are already economical um, and increasingly widely deployed. I feel like one of the interesting dynamics of AI is um, Sequoia Capital had an article on the $600 billion problem or question, which talked about with all the CapEx investments in GPUs and data center build-outs, when will it pay off? And I think that's a problem or a question that the foundation model trainers, uh, training very large models, have to answer. I'm, I'm optimistic they'll come up with a good answer. But it turns out for building applications on top of these foundation models, if someone else has spent billions of dollars training, the economics really works out because with a handful of engineers, you can often build a prototype or build something, deploy it, and so I'm seeing a lot of businesses, certainly at AI Fund, I see a lot of businesses get ROI very quickly from a very modest investment. Right. Um, you know, you've said before that India's AI opportunity lies at the application layer, but within India, there's a debate. Should we build LLMs? Should we focus on application? Are we letting go of the opportunity in building foundational models? Why do you think India should focus on applications? And what specific applications should India prioritize to maximize economic impact? 
So I think India should do both, but the large, very large majority of the focus should be on applications. So um, India has so many talented people, so many great companies. It has the resources to both train foundation models and build applications. Um, but one interesting thing about foundation models is that the cost of training them falls rapidly over time. So models that were cutting edge, you know, two, three years ago, now many research that can can train. And so the moats are not very strong. We'll see how it evolves, but that's true maybe right now. Um, but almost by definition, the only way for the businesses training foundation models to, to kind of work out and do well is the application layer turns out to be even more valuable because we need the applications to generate even more revenue for them to be able to afford to pay the technology companies. Um, so I think in India, there I, I think that the nature of work is transforming. And um, this is not just software engineering, although that is transforming too. But maybe your 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 reporter, Shanja. So on my team at DeepLearn.ai, I have a journalist uh, that just this week um, uh, showed me his code on GitHub, uh, his code that he wrote to scrape websites, screen RSS feeds, and fax to him articles that he thought maybe we should take a look at covering. So I'm seeing people in all walks of life, journalists, marketers, recruiters, on and on and on able to use computers to become much more powerful. And I think India with very strong STEM education, a lot of tech penetration, lots of software services, so kind of a lot of IT services, is actually a pretty good position to help many people in many different walks of life learn enough about computers to, to play a big role in this transformation of work. Right. Um Andrew, you know, as AI compute becomes a geopolitical weapon, how should companies, countries uh, navigate, uh, companies and countries navigate the US-China AI de decoupling? US has also placed uh, controls on export of AI chips, which could have an impact on, you know, emerging economies like India. Um, what's the solution here? Yeah, I think with the, um, the outgoing uh, Biden administration's recent uh, um, uh, declare India uh, tier two in terms of the prioritization of access to GPUs. Candidly, I don't think that's good for the US or for India. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like what the um, export controls on chips have done for the most part is um, uh, incentivize the US's competitors and adversaries to invest a ton in building um, their own independent capability and it's not really slowed others down that much, in, uh, only a little bit. So I feel like um, I think it is unfortunate the state of the world. Uh, I hope that, um, uh, yeah, honestly, I think India and the United States feel like they're natural allies. Um, uh, I really love working with many friends from India. I wish, I, I really hope for continued improvements in how the US and India collaborate. Right. It's a big day today for the US because of, you know, the inauguration of Trump in the White House. What impact will this have on AI going forward? Will it, you know, take US to the forefront? Will there be more focus on uh, semiconductor manufacturing in the US, creation of jobs? It's still too early to say. Um, I know people have very strong feelings about the incoming president, but I think in Silicon Valley, the widespread feeling There's is that optimism. this will be more business friendly. Um, I feel like uh, parts of the outgoing administration felt like it was um, hostile to tech, even hostile to American tech companies, when it, to a level that I've never seen before in my career. And so separately from many other issues, which are important issues, I feel like a more business friendly environment uh, will allow more innovation, allow more things to flourish. Great. Final couple of questions. What are your go to AI apps or chatbots or uh, apart from Kosara, which I'm sure you would yeah. tell us about. Oh, uh, I use, honestly, I actually use multiple of them. Um, I use uh, OpenAI, Claude. Um, uh, I actually use quite, 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 quite a large number of them. I use quite a few agentic workflows and also called up things myself. Uh, recently, my team released an open source AI suite to help developers use multiple large language models and, and, and uh, simultaneously and make it more easy. So I feel like um, it's good to have a suite of AI tools. Right. Do you think the last year has sort of determined the winners in the AI race because we've seen DeepMind make great crews, um, Anthropic do well and OpenAI. So do you think, you know, these three have sort of emerged uh, among the multitude of players that we saw at the foundation? I would say that they definitely um, uh, have strong positions. Oh, I should say the latest version, Gemini 2.0 was, uh, was really impressive. Um, 
Uh, but I think it's too early to too early. call it. Partly because the cost of training foundation models falls rapidly over time. So it would be interesting as these businesses continue to grow, whether, you know, to what extent um, they build more defensible modes. I know that OpenEyes ChatGPT, the consumer business is a wonderful business, but training foundation models because of, you know, uh, uh, NVIDIA and AMD and others driving down the cost of compute, um, I think it, it gets easier and easier for many others to train GPT-4 class models. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how the business dynamics evolve. Right. Final question, Andrew, what would your advice be today to an 18 year old who's, you know, who wants to choose a discipline, but also wants to choose a discipline that will not be disrupted by AI or, you know, it will be disrupted by AI, but his or her job will be secure. I think the world is changing quickly. I think one of the most important skills in the future will be to be able to tell a computer exactly what you wanted to do. And this will be a useful skill in, I think, pretty much all professions, certainly all white collar, probably many blue collar professions as well. So that 18 year old, I, I would say, go learn computers, go learn to code, because um, if you're worried about AI, take control of it and be one of the people who can direct it to do what you want. And that will set you up to be in a much better position for the rest of your career. On that note, thank you very much for talking to us. Wonderful talking to you as always. Thank you, Sanjay.